so good morning um, let's continue with what we were doing on on Friday um, so uh, I made a summary of uh, of the program we had for polar active particles uh, basically uh, we we started looking at these layers of complexity uh, uh, step by step so that uh, essentially we can understand uh, every step and, and uh, the meaning of the ingredients that go to into these complicated equations. Um, so essentially for a polar active particle uh, the complication is you have to worry about uh, translational and orientational degrees of freedom at the same time and that they couple when you write down the Langevin equation because basically the propulsion term will couple the orientation to the position uh, equation. You also see that at the level of the Fouquet-Planck equation when you derive it, uh, essentially the flux that goes into the positional part of Fouquet-Planck will have the orientation uh, degree of freedom. Uh, then in order to deal with that, we um, uh, basically uh, carried out this program of moment expansion. Essentially you start generating moments of the uh, distribution uh, moments in uh, terms of the orientation uh, degree of freedom so that gives you density and polarization and pneumatic order uh, parameter and so on and then each equation will uh, uh, basically be mostly uh, in terms of uh, one of the moments and then there'll be terms coupling uh, from the uh, neighboring moments so for example for the polarization we had density but also pneumatic order parameter and then we had to truncate this at some point um, so truncation and then we started looking at all those terms and tried to see which one uh, might be more important and we uh, only kept some of them, so we made approximations essentially looking at long time limit and uh, 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 large length scale limit and so on um, and chose to eliminate polarization uh, or derive an expression for the polarization in terms of, uh, of the concentration and its gradient. So a key aspect, their key approximation was to assume that the time scale for the relaxation of the polarization was much shorter um, than the typical time scale of variations for the uh, density field. Then we looked at this coefficient gamma and we uh, found uh, uh, different behaviors. So we found cases where gamma could be positive or negative, leading to stability uh, or, or lack of it. And essentially there was a coupling between orientation and propulsion, this V naught times chi that we had. Uh, there was coupling between uh, uh, translational uh, interaction and the alignment interaction and so on. So we looked at all that and in the end uh, we eliminated polarization uh, and managed to write nonlinear self-consistent equation only for the phoretic field psi and uh, density. And then we looked at the stationary state of that for the density. Um, so that means we cannot study time evolution from this point onwards. Um, and that had something like a Boltzmann weight behavior with these parameters. So mu was an effective mu. It had V naught in it. So propulsion, all kinds of non-equilibrium things, coupling between uh, V naught and, and chi, the alignment parameter and so on. And it had this uh, effective diffusion, which is playing the role of what is activating uh, the, the behavior. So effective temperature or diffusion coefficient and that had uh, also expressions from the uh, ingredients from the propulsion term as well as other uh, types of coupling. Um, finally, we just had time to um, insert this expression for rho into our equation for the phoretic uh, uh, potential uh, and now we derive something that looks like Poisson-Boltzmann equation. Yes. <coughs> 
yes, so there is not a universal way that you can have activity. When you go away from equilibrium, you can do it in many different ways. And this class of active matter, so which I call foretic active matter, uh, always involves this thermodynamic potential, let's say chemical potential, concentration, uh, temperature, and so on, uh, which mediates a long-range interaction. That is in competition with the hydrodynamic interaction because they are both long-range. Uh, there are cases where hydrodynamic interaction is more important and there are cases where hydrodynamic interaction is less important or equally important. So if you're interested into the phenomenology, uh, if you remember my... Uh, uh, second lecture, I wrote this Navier-Stokes in which I use the mobility coefficients from hydrodynamics. So any Fokker-Planck equation that you have, you can write down mobility coefficients if you want to uh, just use hydrodynamics uh, in terms of um, effective mobility uh, coefficients. You can introduce an additional velocity field if you want. I didn't do that, so I don't have a Stokes equation here to solve together with my Psi equation and Rho equation. I can do that as well. Uh, and then what I get is essentially uh, uh, a combination of all these different things. Uh, because these systems are typically very complicated, I chose to not use hydrodynamics. Typically, hydrodynamics can at best compete with this type of uh, mechanism. Uh, I don't think it can overpower it. Uh, so that's why we can neglect it if you just want to understand the phenomenology of foretic active matter. But very good question. Okay, yes? Mm -hmm. Here. Yes. Uh, yes, so hydrodynamic limit is the um, uh, expression we use when we look at typical behavior when the particles are far from each other and typical behavior at longest length scale. And if you have something like rho plus Laplacian of rho, it has to be that the length, length scale sits here, apart from some uh, coefficients. So there is alpha here and there is gamma here. And that length scale happened to be the size of the colloid. So I actually drew this so that I would tell you what R is. It's the radius of this. Uh, so what that means is if you go to Fourier space, here you would have something like R squared plus Q squared. And that means uh, when Q is typically a lot smaller than 1 over R, you can ignore this. Okay. Um, you can easily take the Laplacian of that, that gives you some derivatives of psi, and that would modify this, but it will give you corrections that are essentially going to be smaller by the same factor. You'll probably have some gradient squared terms and so on, a little bit of modification, but I mean, those terms are nice when they change the behavior. In this particular case, uh, the derivation tells us that we can make life simple. And, and also, uh, I want to land in this equation because there's a big literature on electrostatics which we can immediately build on. Yeah, good question. Okay, um, so... Yes, so the last thing I said was that um, this equation looks very familiar. Um, it is indeed uh, the Poisson-Boltzmann equation, uh, which we typically write when we want to study electrolytes. Um, and the idea is, yes, we have these charged species in the solution. Uh, they typically, in a mean field description, uh, control the density by having some uh, fast relaxation to a Boltzmann behavior, and also they act as sources and sinks of the same field, which is the electrostatic uh, potential. In this case, we can use this analogy and, and build on that. Um, so I just give you a very uh, quick overview of the exact solutions that exist in uh, the field of uh, nonlinear electro, uh, electrostatics or electrolytes. Uh, 
uh, we typically need to solve this equation with a, uh, a conservation for the number of particles. So let's say uh, we know that we have a fixed number of colloids. Uh, and let's say we do this in d dimensions. Uh, so we need to solve this equation with this um, uh, constraint. In this case, uh, we can have two different um, categories. Um, can have uh, basically uh, uh, an electrostatic analog of the equation that we derived and this would uh, be the case when the product of alpha naught which is the overall rate of catalytic reaction on the colloids and mu effective um, is positive. This is essentially when like charges repel, well you can say predominantly repel because this mu effective is not just mu, it has a term which is proportional to V0 and chi, which basically has that alignment tendency. So if you remember I said that two particles can attract each other simply by their orientations aligning towards the gradient and then deciding to swim towards each other. So that is not a normal electrostatic uh, or gravitational attraction or repulsion, it's an alignment uh, 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 induced uh, effective attraction or repulsion. So in this case, uh, we will have typically the combination of both effects leading to repulsion between like charges and the second category is gravitational when effectively this can be negative and you can say like charges predominantly repel, uh, attract. To highlight the analogy even further, you can define a dimensionless field capital Psi and I choose to multiply it by the sine of alpha naught mu effective and then I will be able to define a generalized theorem length So remember this K effective was almost like a dielectric constant um, with the polar alignment term and so on and then the equivalent of a device screening length or in fact the inverse squared of that which we call kappa squared that is 4 pi L rho naught as you would do that uh, Statics. So then, the equation will become uh, simply that, with the sign essentially being chosen by sign of this product and then we need to keep the the constraint 
we can look for solutions when we have some sort of symmetry, uh, for example, uh, one-dimensional case when you can imagine you have you have a space between two parallel plates uh, of thickness 2h and then size l on each side and then you confine these Janus particles in this space. Um, so first, actually, I forgot, I'm just looking at the electrostatic class. So then in this case, this will give you uh, the equivalent of uh, uh, so-called gui chapman solution, so the one-dimensional solution. Uh, you can write an expression for it. factor and then cos squared of kappa x over square root of 2 this is uh, one plus so you get all these uh, equations in the notes later so don't worry too much about the details Efficient and kappa will be solution to a transcendental equation, so you can solve it exactly. And there'll be regimes where it's equivalent to the uh, case of strong electrostatic uh, correlations and regimes when you have. Uh, weak electrostatic uh, interactions. Uh, typically the the profile, let me actually do it here, for Psi will be, if this is the middle, psi will be a function like that. So it will accumulate in the center and rho will be a function like that. Um, and the interpretation will be that this is equivalent to uh, counter ion condensation. Uh, so the particles will all accumulate near the wall and the thickness of this uh, accumulation region is what in electrostatics people call gui chapman length it's an english chapman um, and that is given by 2 pi l L over L squared inverse. Um, and the potential accumulates in the center despite the fact that uh, particles are mostly accumulated there. You can do this in two dimensions. So um, 2D confinement, confine it to a cylinder and you would get the Manning solution or Manning-Ozawa solution equivalent of a Manning condensation um, and, and so on. You can go to 3D and get the three-dimensional solution and all that. Um, so it's um, it's very nice analogy because it you know we have some intuition from the electrostatics and despite the fact that here things are not exactly equilibrium uh, and there are many elements from orientation and position and so on coming together, at the end of the day you can have very long time behavior that is similar to what we expect from um, electrostatics. In the other category, uh, yes. Uh, 
yes, so the boundary condition that I put is that um, essentially um, on these boundaries, I will have some uh, normal derivative uh, for the concentration, uh, for the thermodynamic potential, and you can use Gauss theorem to derive what that is. So in d dimensions, essentially, where you have a d-dimensional surface of area A, you will have to have this kind of flux on the surface. So if you confine it between two plates, this is equivalent to saying uh, you have something like a charge density on those plates. Uh, so a flux of particles means diffusive flux, uh, and that's simply because if you have a chamber like that and your particles are catalytic, they keep generating products, the products have to go out. So somehow they have to be taken out, which means that you'll have diffusive flux at the boundary that uh, is maintaining your stationary condition. Uh, if this is a temperature, then heat has to go out, so you have to maintain your uh, stationary condition, and, and that flux at the surface is exactly the same as what a charged plate does in electro, uh, electrostatic problem. It basically generates a flux for the electric field, uh, which is essentially another way of saying it neutralizes the, the chamber. Um, so you can get this simply by integrating that equation using Gauss's theorem and so on. Um, Okay, so the second class, which is more interesting, is the gravitational one. Um, and it's more interesting because it has an instability. So uh, here, essentially, you would have, let's say I go to 3D straight away. Uh, you will have a situation where you confine your system uh, in a, a spherical container and ask the solution, uh, the, the, the question, okay, what is the stationary uh, uh, profile uh, solution of that equation? And the answer is uh, you will get, let's say if we are in 3D, we are only interested in uh, solutions of this kind, so radially symmetric, uh, axially symmetric, so only radial dependence, and that gives me a density profile which is essentially peaked at the center and uh, corresponding to that there will be uh, a profile for the so I'll do it at the top here so that they don't overlap so there'll be a profile for psi as well um, essentially that means this uh, uh, in, in uh, contrast to the previous case where the particles accumulate also the thermodynamic potential uh, psi accumulates. Um, if you use the analogy, if you use uh, the choice of temperature for psi, uh, then you can call this uh, a colloidal star because essentially what this is is a, a stable, spherically symmetric distribution of uh, particles that generate heat, they act as sources of heat, and essentially they have this uh, effective attraction which will keep them in a stable uh, uh, arrangement with a well-defined radius. So this value, uh, let's say R star, will be uh, the radius that you will see even if you confine the system, uh, you'll see another radius uh, which is picked up by the distribution here. Uh, yes. Uh, you're asking, does it minimize the energy? Uh, can you repeat the question? Uh, so energy is something you need to define here. There is no energy. But if you want to define a generalized energy by multiplying rho, which is this guy, by psi, and look at that, uh, because the description is basically identical to Poisson-Boltzmann, you will get essentially the same expression. So not just energy, but free energy, which will be rho log rho, and then plus that expression for energy, 
you can write it and then use the variation uh, of that and, and then you will derive this equation if you impose the constraint that the total number should be cons uh, conserved. But this is a, I would say this is an outcome or, or, or a byproduct of the, of the description. It's not something that you would have started with because this is a very uh, non-equilibrium process. Question here? Um, I guess what I'm saying is there is no real definition for energy uh, in this system because, for example, mu has V0 in it and so on. It, it's a non-equilibrium uh, system with no clear definition for microscopic definition for energy. But when you get to this level, you can define generalized energies and generalized free energies and generalized entropies simply by similarity. And then it will minimize that. Okay, uh, so this solution will be a colloidal star, uh, but then you can change the parameters and because of the attractive interaction, there will be an instability. Uh, and when the instability happens, essentially, so I can put quotations here, when the instability happens, essentially this structure will rumble and collapse. Uh, and if this parameter is chosen to be temperature at that collapsed uh, state, temperature will shoot up, uh, essentially that would look like an exp explosion uh, and you would call that condition uh, a colloidal supernova uh, and the way it works out is simply um, you can calculate the density I didn't introduce this parameter, but you can calculate the density in the in the center, uh, the row at the midpoint, and that would be a good description or indicator of uh, the behavior of the system as a function of effectively that uh, uh, non-dimensional uh, tuning parameter that we have. So in one D, that is basically. Um, something you get from Guy Chapman length, this is 1D. Uh, in 2D you get the Manning parameter and in 3D you get the generalized version of that. Essentially you start from 1 when there is little coupling, you increase and then at some critical value of that quantity uh, there will be an instability and it shoots up. Uh, this way. This is basically, if, if psi is uh, concentration field, this is basically what we call chemotactic collapse. Uh, but in fact, uh, I like the analogy with, uh, with astrophysics because uh, essentially there, there's a lot of literature in gravitation that you can mimic by uh, following that analogy and uh, essentially using this, uh, uh, this mapping. Yes, Conrad. Okay, um, so what I mean by Debye length is um, typically an average way of, uh, so the full distribution is some constant rho naught times an exponential. And when you solve uh, for psi, there will be variations, so the distribution uh, will, will have variations. However, there is a prefactor, which is essentially some scale of the density of your colloids in the system. Uh, if you only specify the total number, uh, then that density rho naught is determined basically after you find your solution. Essentially, you know the total number, you know the to total volume, and you solve for your uh, profile, and then this prefactor rho naught will come out of this constraint, and then you put it there. Uh, but this is exactly how it's defined in electrostatic, uh, in el basically theory of electrolytes as well. So this parameter rho naught is always a scale when the interactions are weak. Essentially, this is the overall density or the average density, if you want. And when they are strong, there will be strong variations. Uh, uh, as you can see in this quantity, you can start from 1 when there is no electrostatic or gravitational coupling and go to values that are typically uh, much higher. In the notes, I have a little bit more information about this.
So I forgot to say that um, basically um, today I will go over everything that is left in my uh, notes, so you will find all the calculations and so on. I will just tell you stories um, and just tell you the, the content uh, very quickly, and then you will see the, the notes uh, posted. Yes, Eric. Yeah, so electrostat uh, so the gravitational uh, mapping is not exact in the sense that uh, typically you have um, an equation of state that goes into when you want to solve for the structure of a star or, or, or something like that. You will have to decide how you generate the heat. For example, you, you need to put something about the nuclear reactions and, and so on. So there are some details uh, that are different, but overall the phenomenology, if you if you don't worry too much about the details in terms of how many different solutions you can get and instabilities and so on, uh, I would say, I mean, this is this is a dissipative version of gravitation. There is something like a Poisson-Boltzmann equation if you're interested in crude uh, sort of. Uh, descriptions of the stability because people I mean there are people who don't believe that you can equilibrate anything in in astrophysics uh, or astrophysical context uh, but there are also some people who say let's assume that you can and you write something like a Boltzmann weight uh, and then you solve it self-consistently I mean I've seen books on that uh, but but also there are other people who say you you have to start from Boltzmann equation and that's the only way uh, there are people who do the relativistic uh, astrophysics, uh, so they worry about velocities being very high and, and close to, to C, uh, and doing thermodynamics in velocities very close to C. I guess uh, there are all kinds of flavors of, 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 of um, astrophysics. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so, yes, this is basically, um, uh, as I said, you can find more details if you want to, to follow this kind of story. Uh, basically what I wanted to say about this um, topic and, and uh, essentially um, I think I need to close it by saying what happens uh, I'll probably need this So there are, of course, other uh, details that we forgot or, 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 or ignored. Um, for example, uh, one important one is that typically catalytic reaction involves a substrate particle approaching here and then after the catalysis going out as product particle, maybe even more than one. Uh, so there is this aspect of having more than one uh, species of the chemical in the solution, which we will have to add. If you think about it, taking away a substrate molecule and introducing one or two product molecules will basically give you different species or populations of something that you need to do. So everything that we did here, you can just repeat it for all these uh, uh, different uh, concentrations and every one of them together its own, uh, with its own uh, mobility will contribute to the slip velocity and then you can work out exactly what happens um, to the combination of these effects. Um, so one effect that we need to add is this uh, notion of S going to P, and then we need to do phoresis plus chemotaxis for S and P. I also ignored tensorial structure. So there were many things that uh, had tensorial structure. For example, mu was a tensor uh, and I ignored that, uh, just treated it as a scalar. Uh, polarization, 
because of that tensorial structure will come out as a uh, vector which represents the longitudinal fluctuation so along uh, the wave vector and perpendicular to the wave vector the transverse component and because of the tensorial structure these would be different uh, and we need to write equations for both uh, species um, and so on uh, time dependence of uh, yeah so this is etc for the tensorial structure So what we did was basically we ignored several terms until we managed to solve for P and plug it in the equation we had for rho. But you cannot always do that when you keep the tensorial structure and also you're interested in the time dependence of P itself and possibly instabilities, as I told you about. So that the R term, which got a correction and at sufficiently high densities, you can have instability in the orientation. So all of that needs to be kept uh, also. And then if you do all that... Uh, we can get various uh, forms of instability um, and collective uh, behavior, so clusters, patterns, asters, plasma oscillations, and spontaneous oscillations. Okay, uh, so you'll find uh, references if you want to, to read more about this in the notes. Okay, so the next topic uh, I want to look at is enhanced diffusion of enzymes. Um, this is basically uh, going to change the length scale and, and take us to the molecular scale. Uh, so let's say uh, we have an enzymatic reaction. So typically enzymatic reactions are uh, described like that. So you have an enzyme which we can represent uh, like a bean. Uh, so I call this the bean shape model of, uh, or the bean model of enzyme. Uh, and then you will have a substrate molecule. This is using the terminology of biochemistry. Uh, and somehow you can have a binding uh, between the enzyme and the substrate. Um, so typically they say the enzyme has a binding pocket which will uh, preferentially uh, attract and, and bind to the molecule and then the binding will somehow modify this uh, molecule and essentially you will you can represent uh, now this uh, 
new molecule which is the product by a different shape and then what happens is your uh, enzyme is now going to be free in the end and the product molecule which looks different from the initial molecule will come out and the enzyme is free to bind again and engage in this kind of reaction. If you want to essentially think about what the enzyme actually does, uh, we can use uh, reaction coordinates uh, like we heard about this morning and say a reaction is typically going to involve uh, going across a uh, free energy barrier of some sort along this reaction coordinate uh, which will describe the chemical reaction and this will typically happen in the solution in the bulk solution uh, but only very very rarely so it will have to be a very long time uh, for the system to wait here until it can uh, get that thermal kick which is strong enough to take it over the barrier when the enzyme comes along and does this uh, essentially what it's doing is modifying the energy barrier for this reaction so let's say it changes it to this and now of course uh, smaller thermal kicks can achieve the same thing uh, and that means it will be much faster when uh, the reaction uh, takes place and the rate effectively will, will increase uh, you can work out the kinetics of this uh, simple uh, reaction scheme um, I would like to emphasize uh, that I'm making the reaction non-equilibrium by allowing this leg of the reaction to only go forward. Uh, that was just the choice I made. Essentially, it's equivalent to saying that I'm preparing my system in a condition that the backward rate is going to be uh, a lot slower. So in, in uh, theory, all of these uh, reaction uh, uh all of these uh, possible reactions will will uh, be able to uh, occur but the rates are going to be different in numbers and uh, typically an enzyme is the provider of, of an effective non-equilibrium behavior which means that the forward rate is going to be a lot faster than the backward rate when it's present uh, so then you can uh, work out the stationary state of this kinetic equation and that gives you uh, the so-called michaelis menten rule essentially the overall rate of uh, product uh, production or production of the product molecule will be proportional to k cat this uh, enzymatic uh, rate here the concentration of enzymes I uh, call it E naught in the solution and then the substrate concentration divided by the substrate concentration plus uh, an equilibrium uh, constant which people call in this context uh, Michaelis constant so Michaelis constant is always a concentration So for, for us, what an enzyme does is driving the system away from equilibrium at the right place and at the right time. So there has been recently uh, experimental observation that enzymes diffuse faster. presence of substrate 
with Michaelis Menten behavior, so that's important. Um, and typically, an order of magnitude, which is basically a fraction of, you know, just around 10%, 20%, that kind of behavior for the magnitude of the effect, and then you will have Michaelis Menten behavior on the substrate. So something looking very much like what we have here, uh, and a prefactor which is of order uh, 10 to the minus 1. So how can we explain that? Uh, essentially there are many ways that this can happen uh, but the question is are they strong enough to explain the order of magnitude of the of the phenomenon for example you can imagine So you can imagine cell phoresis to be uh, the cause of that and the enzyme is definitely asymmetric, it has a binding pocket so the reaction is happening asymmetrically around it uh, and then maybe instantaneously that uh, gradient of concentration of the substrate and products uh, or possibly gradient of temperature because uh, the reaction is releasing some thermal energy, so exothermic uh, reactions will also release a pocket of, of thermal energy into the surrounding uh, region. Uh, maybe that creates a gradient of temperature. All of that will be randomized over the time scale of the rotational uh, diffusion of the molecule. Um, you can estimate that when you put in numbers, uh, the number comes out So, 15 orders of magnitude, uh, which is, well, it's good for astrophysics and, and cosmology, it's not really good for us. Um, okay, so the first one uh, probably is not playing a significant role. Um, it was suggested that uh, because observations uh, were predominantly or, or initially done only on very fast and very exothermic enzymes, I mean enzymes catalyzing very exothermic reactions. Uh, it was suggested that maybe it's simply the um, heat or, or that content of energy, thermal energy, which is released into the solution is somehow released in an asymmetric way because of the asymmetry of the molecule and that leads to a contribution to the center of mass uh, coordinate. So think about equipartition, you're releasing some thermal energy, all of the degrees of freedom, probably there are 10,000 or 100,000 degrees of freedom in this enzyme or protein, uh, each will take a fraction of that and the center of mass velocity will also have a fraction of that and if you calculate that, uh, that will also lead to uh, enhanced diffusion, so translational velocity which is randomized over rotational diffusion time, so let me write it first. You can work out an expression for uh, for the contribution to, uh, to, to diffusion uh, coefficient. It will be proportional to the heat of reaction. This is the uh, fraction, the equipartition argument that I mentioned, fraction of uh, energy uh, going into center of mass uh, and then thermal energy, this is the 
overall rate and this is the time scale of uh, randomization you can say it's the uh, rotational diffusion time let's say uh, If you put in numbers in this expression, um, it comes out as 10 to the minus 9. Uh, so again, uh, a possible mechanism giving you a contribution, but the contribution is not strong enough. Okay, what else? So we can actually have... Uh, what I'd like to call stochastic swimming. So I didn't talk at all uh, here about uh, uh, swimmer models where basically the, there will be conformational changes and, and changes in shape. Uh, uh, for example, using uh, spheres, you can take three of them if you're interested in uh, obtaining a net translational velocity, but if you're interested in uh, just getting a contribution to the effective diffusion coefficient, you can already take two. Uh, and if two of them are just opening and closing in a random stochastic way, um, and while doing that, they're also rotating, uh, you can calculate the contribution to uh, rotational diffusion. In fact, uh, the changes in conformation don't have to be uh, deterministic as we normally do when we study models of Lorenz uh, number swimmer. Uh, it can be stochastic in the sense that you can calculate what conformational changes will uh, uh, give you in terms of contribution to velocity and then build a stochastic description in which the molecule will make transitions between these different states and calculate uh, overall rates of moving into the uh, space of conformation and then uh, calculate how you cover uh, uh, the, the area in the space of conformation. This is because essentially a low Reynolds, uh, uh, so, so a swimming velocity at low Reynolds number can be written in terms of a geometric quantity, is the rate at which you cover areas in the space of uh, conformation. Um, and you can do that in a, in a stochastic model. Um, if you do this calculation for um, this very simple version with two spheres, you will get um, essentially an expression which uh, let's say if I have uh, okay so I need to define my rates um, so suppose I have two states I have a closed state and an open state and I assume that the transition from closed so this is state number one this is state number two uh, so this is closed and open Transition from 1 to 2 happens uh, with the rate k. That's basically my assumption uh, all along that this is coupled to the enzymatic activity. And then there'll be a relaxation going back from uh, 2 to 1. Um, and that will happen with another rate. Uh, you can call it kr. That's typically a polymer relaxation time. If you're thinking about your uh, enzyme having some conformational change and then relaxing into its equilibrium configuration. Uh, as a as a polymer basically uh, and then overall it will have this uh, rate of uh, rotational diffusion which is which is dr um, if we put all these together uh, we can calculate an expression for the uh, change in the uh, diffusion coefficient that will be proportional to um, essentially the amplitude of, uh, of uh, so I'm calling this amplitude B of the conformational change. It will be proportional to D squared and then some mixture of these rates. And if we assume that uh, essentially dr uh, and kr are both relaxations of some object uh, with that size, they are 
essentially of the same order and much higher than the catalytic rate, which is typically, so if you're looking at a nanometer uh, uh, scale enzyme, uh, you're looking at time scales here that are in the range of, um, or, or rates that are in the range of um, 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8, uh, second inverse, and this catalytic rate is typically at best 10 to the 4. Uh, so th this is um, typically valid, and what that means is uh, this expression is uh, essentially k times b squared. So very simply, it would give you the rate of catalytic activity times the amplitude uh, squared. You can take that and uh, calculate delta d over d naught uh, and put in numbers. Um, this is basically, I think I should be conservative and say it's of the order of 10 to the minus 3. Uh, so stochastic swimming uh, can contribute uh, to effective enhanced diffusion with this non-equilibrium uh, description uh, as well, but the contribution in numbers is not going to be sufficiently large. So as you can see, the picture is getting more and more confusing because we're running out of options and the numbers don't add up uh, for us. So this was the situation in 2015. Uh, most of you were sleeping very, very well. Uh, I wasn't uh, because I knew all this uh, and I knew about the experiment, so it wasn't a happy situation. Um, so what, what else can we have? Uh, that's a possibility, of course. Yeah, that's. Uh, I mean, an experimentalist could say that. I would. I would put it on you if anyone ever says that later on. Um, but uh, well, for the sake, because it's not my expertise to uh, to check the experiment, I'll just assume that the experiment is right, and and we go forward. Uh, uh, so there are now many experiments uh, reproducing essentially that uh, many many attempts to reproduce that experiments, but all of them have used FCS. So if there is a systematic uh, uh, error in that experiment, it must be it, it 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 must be because of how fluorescence correlation spectroscopy works, which is essentially uh, so you probably know better than me. It's basically a a method in which you illuminate a region in the microscope and particles come in and, and go out and then for a very short time you have access to a few of them that have diffusive behavior and you use those very short uh, trajectories to average uh, and extract some sort of uh, diffusion coefficient from them. Um, okay, uh, there is another possibility. I told you that the experiment uh, until 2015 um, was always uh, reported on highly exothermic and highly fast enzymes. So the fast aspect uh, was pushing us towards thinking about non-equilibrium uh, processes and the exothermic one uh, towards thinking about these uh, exotic possibilities. But in fact, if you have a highly exothermic reaction and a sufficiently dense concentration of enzymes, uh, so you have all these sources of heat, releasing heat all the time in the solution, it's possible that the overall temperature of your uh, chamber will go up by a couple of degrees, and then if you put that into Stokes-Einstein, in fact, um, if you incorporate the way uh, viscosity depends on temperature as well, which in the room temperature range for water, uh, there seems to be a region where you have quite a uh, big sensitivity, the, there's uh, this ar Arrhenius, dependence, but you actually put in numbers, you can see that there could be another factor of two coming from the way that viscosity depends on temperature. So uh, then you can convince yourself that maybe after all it's just a boring effect in which you raise the temperature a little bit and you just see Stokes-Einstein uh, working uh, its way. Uh, so this was my best explanation in 2015, uh, not assuming that the experiments are wrong. Uh, so let me put this option here. Okay. So if you put in numbers, in fact, because I did it for every one of them, uh, this comes out as, well, 0.5. 
just about. I mean, certainly the strongest of any of these mechanisms that I've uh, discussed here, and just about, uh, so maybe one order of magnitude missing um, in terms of, uh, of, of, the, um, uh, of quantitative agreement, so in terms of the magnitude. Yes, Don. Yes, uh, so you are uh, you are uh, quicker than I was in 2015. So you are um, anticipated what is coming next. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, basically you're absolutely right. So I'll I'll, I'll get into that. Um, yeah. So okay. Um, Yes, so um, essentially, um, I mean, in the meantime, before I, I start with my uh, with the description of what I want to to uh, uh, to calculate, uh, in the meantime, there was also an experimental report which showed that you don't have to have an uh, exothermic enzyme, and in fact, you don't have to have a very very fast enzyme to get. Uh, this kind of effect. Uh, so there was an experiment done on an uh, enzyme called aldolase, which is endothermic and also quite uh, slow. Uh, so the rate for aldolase was around uh, 1 to 5 um, second inverse, and there was still this level of uh, enhancement in the diffusion plus michaelis menten behavior. Um, so if you think about it, um, I told you that because the enhancement in the diffusion has michaelis menten behavior, and because we are talking about enzymes that are very fast, uh, we immediately thought that, yes, Um, so you mean to explain this experiment? Uh, um, so the, I think what we should bear in mind is enzymes when we look at the, 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 the solutions, have very small volume fractions. So if you put in numbers, the solution of enzyme that you're typically looking at, uh, volume fraction will be, I don't know, 10 to the minus 5 or 6 or something like that, or maybe maybe 4. And typically, any shift in viscosity would be of the order of Einstein's relation, which is, you know, you have 1 minus a, a term of the order of volume fraction. Uh, with some coefficient. And when you have an active system with bacteria and so on, you have a better coefficient than, I don't remember what it is, uh, maybe five halves or something like that. Um, but the fact that it's proportional to the volume fraction still s uh, stays. And with bacteria, you have 10 microns, you have the flagella that are sticking out, so the effective volume fraction that a bacterium occupies and interacts with the fluid is is essentially such that a bacterial suspension is in the 10 to the minus 1 range in volume fraction. So I, I wouldn't say that the enzyme solution can do that uh, uh, based on the numbers, but it's a good suggestion. Okay, uh, so basically I 
uh, sort of led you to believe that because we observed michaelis menten behavior uh, and because these were very fast enzymes, uh, we had to have this, which is basically right. It's the equation that I have right over there. Um, but if you think about it, we didn't really check this part. Um, so it's possible that this ratio is proportional to the fraction S divided by S plus K, but for a different reason. Uh, not because this is dP by dT uh, in the michaelis menten rule. So this was something that uh, basically was somehow implicitly assumed by everyone who was thinking about enzymes. And naturally, when slow enzymes started to show this behavior as well, it was uh, essentially obvious that we should now, I mean, it was impossible. Already we were in trouble with orders of magnitude, and now you're losing your 10 to the 4 or 10 to the 5th uh, that you have because of the catalytic rate. So we're even in bigger trouble in terms of explaining the magnitude. Um, so then, at that point only, I started thinking as uh, Don suggested, which is, um, is it really possible that we don't understand what the equilibrium diffusion coefficient of an object like an enzyme is? Um, it's not just, you know, uh, KBT divided by a s uh, 6 pi times uh, eta times the, the radius of a, of a sphere that we can draw around it, but maybe there are some contributions uh, into this uh, which can change when the enzyme basically undergoes um, th the catalytic activity that it does. And then somehow you can modify those when you incorporate the substrate and it's because of that that we are seeing changes. So in other words, what I'm saying is uh, if my enzyme, now my enzyme is two beans, not just one bean. Uh, uh, so suppose this is my enzyme. I mean, it has to be that I have some internal degree of freedom in the enzyme that can change, because otherwise the enzyme cannot function. So suppose I have an object which is made of two components, and I'm asking, okay, what is the translational diffusion coefficient of this compound object, which is made of two components, say rigid components that are attached by some sort of potential. So they are fluctuating, uh, and they're also doing stochastic motion in the solution, what is the diffusion coefficient of the center of mass degree of freedom of this object? And how does it depend on the internal structure? And if I can answer that question, then maybe I can answer the question, when the enzyme undergoes whatever it does, that it does through the catalytic uh, uh, cycle of activity, then how does that effective diffusion coefficient as a function of the internal degrees of freedom uh, change? Okay, so this is basically the way we started thinking about this. Um, so essentially we uh, took the simplest model with two uh, components and in general the two components will be asymmetric, they won't be like each other uh, and that will be quite important when you do the calculation. Um, and essentially what we did was um, similar to the sort of things that um, we have done in, in these lectures. So we wrote down the uh, Fokker-Planck equation for this object with two components um, and keeping the mobility terms and then the Fokker-Planck equation with the translational coupling and the rotational coupling and so on uh, will give you a term which essentially couples orientation of this molecule, uh, which is let's say in this direction, uh, to its translational motion because essentially if the two objects are different and they are fluctuating, they are exerting forces on each other. So let's say if the uh, spring, if the interaction potential, uh, let's say x is this uh, coordinate, is something like that. So I have an equilibrium length, I have a stiffness, and there's thermal fluctuations in this uh, coordinate x. Uh, then essentially when x is above a, uh, there'll be a force dipole uh, pushing them inwards, and when x is below a, there'll be uh, a force dipole pushing them outwards, and essentially what you have is a fluctuating force dipole uh, 
which will couple hydrodynamically. So if the two objects are the same, a fluctuating force dipole will not lead to any net translational motion. If they are different, then a fluctuating force dipole will lead to some translational motion, which is randomized over the rotational diffusion time, and it gives you a contribution to the diffusion coefficient. So uh, essentially, this uh, basically uh, is another way of saying that the diffusion coefficient of an object uh, of this kind um, is made of a part which is the average diffusion coefficient. So if you think about calculating the average mobility of this object, which is equivalent to saying I, I put a sphere on it and, and see what kind of effective sphere describes that as a solid object, and then there is a correction, there's a part which will be uh, essentially caused by by the fluctuations. I call it the fluctuation-induced uh, correction to the diffusion coefficient, and I choose to have uh, this symbol delta D uh, basically for the magnitude of this quantity, and then you will be able to show that this quantity is universally negative. Okay, so essentially uh, when you look at all these thermal fluctuations of the internal degrees of freedom, you always contribute a negative contribution to the center of mass motion. How do we calculate this? It's again moment expansion. So you basically have uh, a situation where if these beams are spheres, you just have one orientational order uh, parameter or vector to deal with. If uh, they are asymmetric, then you have uh, essentially two other ones. Uh, so you can go to Tun Rayo's poster out there and, and see how this calculation is set up. Uh, you will do a moment expansion in all of these orientations and then you close them and then you bring them back into the equation for the uh, center of mass diffusion and you calculate all these correction terms. Uh, what comes out, this negative universal uh, fluctuation induced term, will essentially have different contributions from different uh, modes of fluctuation that you can have. For example, uh, if you will have only a center of mass fluctuations like that, uh, you will get a contribution um, to do with that. If you also have orientational fluctuations, you will have contributions to do with that. Yes? Equilibrium. They are thermal and equilibrium. So um, I should. So what the average is, is essentially the following quantity. So actually, let me write somewhere on the board that I'm looking at equilibrium. Um, and what D average is, is essentially KBT times the average of, of the mobility tensor. So typically this object will be made of a few components, and each component will have a mobility tensor, uh, not the off-diagonal parts, but the diagonal parts if you want. So the, uh, if you call this 1, this is mu 1 1 plus mu 2 2, this kind of thing, uh, and then the thermal average of that. So that typically will only give you uh, essentially the part of friction or mobility that deals with the shape and how it looks. It's the average shape and how it looks. Uh, this part um, essentially comes from integrating these degrees of freedom and looking at what happens after that. If you do the moment expansion, you only have access to the longest possible time scale, so moment expansion calculation will give you this expression. If you're not happy with that, you can actually do better for a simpler version, so just keep spheres instead of these bean-shaped objects and use a path integral uh, scheme uh, together with the sort of pre-averaging that we do in polymer physics so that we can sort of pre-average the distance dependencies into simple functions. Uh, then you can calculate the effective as a function of time and show that you start off uh, 
at some value and then you cross over to another value. Uh, so this is actually the average and this is what I call uh, the total d effective at infinity. So it's d average minus this fluctuation induced correction. And this time scale is the typical relaxation time of the internal degrees of freedom. Done. Um, it's not, okay, so it, it won't be non-Gaussian uh, in the sense that if you look at the longest time scale, you only see one diffusion coefficient and the Gaussian behavior. If you're interested into the crossover from short time behavior to the long time behavior, what you're essentially doing is going from, uh, you know, even when you're looking at the diffusion of a rod, we have that because at short times, a rod is asymmetric and diffusion is different in this direction compared to that direction. And then if you are long at longer times than the rotational diffusion time, you just see it as an average sphere, basically. Exactly. And, and this is exactly the same. So at short times, it will be a mixture of all these different degrees of freedom contributing. And, and then you go across these different time scales. If you have more than one time scale of relaxation, you'll have more than one time scale at which uh, this actually happens. Okay, so, so far I haven't done anything about catalysis and enzyme uh, activity and so on. I just, you know, we just went back to the drawing board and said, do we understand the equilibrium diffusion coefficient of a compound object which is made of components? And uh, now that we are one step uh, 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 further into this understanding, then we can uh, switch on that kind of uh, activity and see what uh, the effect of that is. So this is essentially, if you want, diffusion uh, of a compound structure or object at equilibrium. So now let's say we have enzymes, which means we have these uh, objects with different degrees of freedom. So for example, uh, because of the uh, internal elongation uh, degree of freedom, this one can fluctuate between uh, small distances and, and larger distances. And let's say now we uh, introduce a binding of a substrate. So what binding does um, is essentially somehow constrain the fluctuations. I mean, I don't really know exactly how it does it for catalase and urease and aldolase and so on but I know that it has to constrain the fluctuations. It cannot, uh, I mean, it, it possibly can, but generically you would expect it to uh, somehow lead to, uh, to a reduction in the, uh, in the extent of fluctuation. So let's say this is my substrate and it binds and somehow it, it uh, keeps hold of, uh, um, of these components. Th this can be done by, let's say, stiffening of this spring, which is in between. It can be done by reducing that equilibrium length that I had. So 
So it can be done by changing this parameter or changing this parameter. No matter how it does it, you know, you should think about what we do when we study thermal ratchets. So you basically go from one potential landscape, which is something that we do for molecular motors as well, to another one, which is basically going to happen upon binding of this additional molecule in the solution. So then I would say uh, somehow the fluctuations are, are hampered. Uh, it could also be that uh, here I had orientational fluctuations uh, that were quite uh, free and, and now because of the binding uh, orientational fluctuation is hampered. So hydrodynamic coupling will basically contribute uh, some term from all of these degrees of freedom to that fluctuation induced term. Uh, if you work out uh, this in the sense of, of writing two populations, one which is free and one which is bound, and then combine them and look at the stationary state uh, together with the kinetics of binding on binding, essentially uh, you can show that it's possible to write to the lowest order approximation uh, an expression for the change in the diffusion coefficient of the center of mass degree of freedom, which has the Michaelis-Menten behavior and has a coefficient which is just of order 1 or, uh, or of order 0.1 uh, because it's a geometric quantity. It's something which is controlling, uh, which is being controlled by, by the degree of fluctuations, let's say um, something like an amplitude divided by the size or equilibrium value and so on. These are all uh, typical length scales, uh, or you can write them as typical length scales. Uh, importantly, this is not because this is proportional to the overall rate of reaction, so dp by dt. Actually, I searched whether a symbol like that exists in mathematics, and, and I think I didn't find a conclusive answer, that you are allowed rigorously to say something is not proportional to something. So I'll just say it in words, uh, that this is not proportional to that. Uh, or, or I can just write it like that, yeah. despite this, this form. And what this form really tells you is the probability of binding, so a probability of a substrate binding to the enzyme, which is what is controlling Michaelis-Menten behavior. Uh, but in this case, the rest of it, so the coefficient, is going to be the same. Yes? Yeah, so this is a very good question. Um, essentially, uh, what you're asking, uh, or another way of saying what you're, what you're saying is, can you predict which enzyme is going to show an enhancement which is of that order of magnitude and which enzyme might not show an enhancement of this order of magnitude? It has to do with the, the way the enzyme is structured and sort of loosely speaking, you can say in order to have this kind of effect, you need to have secondary structures that are uh, relatively, so, so you have to have a structure for the enzyme which is modular. You have big blobs that are connected by some loose uh, uh, linkers and categorically you would expect an enzyme to have this kind of structure because it has to accommodate that substrate into the binding pocket, do something to it, so some conformational change, and then let it go. Um, and I'm just guessing that in order to be able to do that, you have to have a structure like that. But it's true although there is no official record of this, uh, I think experimentalists tend to try all the enzymes and only report those that show the effects, so you don't really have the null uh, results, and it would have been much uh, more helpful to have the null results, you know, knowing basically which enzyme shows this effect and which enzyme doesn't, and then you can start to think about exactly how we can predict something uh, about this behavior. Okay? Good. Uh, so I guess I'm done with, uh, with this aspect. Uh, the next topic 
yes, and this is an equilibrium uh, uh, paradigm, so I'm, I don't need to have the k cat sitting in front of my expression. Uh, what I have is basically the equilibrium diffusion coefficient of an object which can have conformational fluctuations depends on the exact conformational or, or extent of conformational fluctuations. If substrate binding changes that, that will change the equilibrium one. So by, by having essentially uh, catalytic activity, you, you provide a knob by which you're changing the equilibrium state of the system or going through one to, an to another. Yes, Don. So I would expect that, yes, and, and I mean, what I said was generically I expect it to go down because binding typically would, would introduce constraints on the system. But in, your, in the case you're saying, it would do the opposite. The diffusion coefficient, exactly. Uh, I haven't heard the report of that, but in principle, that, that is a possibility, yeah. No, that's a good point, yes. Yeah, so all of that goes into this coefficient, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. So I calculate, we calculate expressions for A, and then we look at the, the expression. The expression involves ratios of length scales, essentially. So I'm saying uh, if the conformational change is, say, roughly 10% of the size of the enzyme uh, or, or of the same order of magnitude, I expect these combinations of length scale ratios to give me that kind of order of magnitude. So you could get something which is a little bit higher or, or lower, and, and basically that depends on the model that you're using. But I made my introduction so that now I don't have to uh, defend this too strongly because basically now you see that any other mechanism is barely going to be strong enough to be able to explain something of order 10 to the minus 1. And the fact that this mechanism is an equilibrium one, which is there anyway, and, and this coefficient is just ratios of length scales, I don't have to, so there is no fine tuning necessary. There is no, you know, I don't need to do anything. This will naturally be of this order. Uh, it's just that it has to have this kind of property, that it has some modular structure which, which is connected by loose uh, co coefficient, um, uh, tethers. Okay, so I know my time is, is uh, uh, coming to an end. I'll just uh, list what I didn't have time to, to uh, discuss. Uh, so same system was put into a more non-equilibrium uh, condition by essentially generating a gradient in the substrate. Uh, you can, of course, do that, and then uh, uh, people observed uh, net migration of the enzyme uh, towards the direction of the substrate, and they called it uh, chemotaxis of active of enzymes. This is interesting because when you think about chemotaxis in the context of bacteria, they have very sophisticated circuits to be able to sense and respond uh, when it comes to, to gradients of what they're interested in. Uh, we already saw that with colloids, this was not a big deal. And in fact, uh, you can sort of see that it's not a big deal for enzymes either because you can naturally extend what we did in the, in the first two lectures uh, to enzymes. You will have components, exactly the same Fokker-Planck equation uh, with the hydrodynamic mobility tensors. And you can expect to have a contribution coming from the phoretic response uh, of the enzyme to the concentration gradient. You can also have another contribution coming from the diffusion coefficient, which depends locally on the substrate concentration, which is itself changing because there's a gradient. And you combine them, you look at uh, the tendencies, and it turns out that in some condition uh, it's expected to go to the substrate uh, source, and in some other cases it's expected to go to the opposite case. There are experimental reports of both, and the, the reports are consistent with what we see in this calculation, namely in, uh, when the substrate concentration is much higher than Michaelis constant, 
you expect it to go to the source, so be positive chemotaxis, and when the concentration is very small, uh, the concentration is very small, the, the enzyme will go away from the source. Um, although there is no systematic experiment uh, yet that has checked whether you get a transition as you systematically change the concentration. So the experiments are done uh, in the groups of Ayush Mansen showing chemotaxis towards and the group of Steve Granick showing chemotaxis away. And they currently uh, both think that they are in contradiction with each other, but we actually think that they are both uh, okay, but it's just that they are looking at things in the, in the regimes that are different from one another. Um, so then I also had uh, uh, some material on bacterial chemotaxis. I called it uh, chemotaxis on the slow lane. This is essentially surface moving bacteria that they leave um, uh, uh, polysaccharide trails. Uh, they are very interesting systems. Uh, basically, it's diffusion equation not in the regime where you can ignore this but in the regime where you can ignore that because uh, essentially if you leave a polymer on a substrate and then uh, the bacteria all propel so they move about uh, in the time scale that they see each other and there's collective behavior there's essentially no diffusion of the polymers they are essentially uh, completely uh, stationary, but they provide a dynamic uh, realization of something that looks like a quench disorder, so they would feel that and interact with that. It's a very interesting system. Uh, a few things uh, have been done on this. Uh, uh, I believe Don is also working on that uh, together with, with Jared Wong. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, I wanted to say a few words about what happens when you have uh, the case when uh, in cells or, or, or units interact both chemotactically and also there's cell division and cell death, so the number conservation also breaks down, and then you, you can show that in this case the two uh, processes can compete with each other and, and generate an interesting behavior in which you can have uh, uh, phase transition, dynamical phase transition between different states. Um, okay, so I think with this uh, I can... Um finish my, my lectures and you will find the rest of the material that I produced including the calculations uh, in the notes that will be posted hopefully today. So thank you.